This is what the Russian army left behind. The village of Teterivska, about 70 kilometers northeast of Kiev, is one of the places where the Russian invasion came to a halt. Bars, as he calls himself, took part in the battle. Russia has a bigger army in terms of numbers and equipment. I'm not talking about the quality of the equipment, but it is a lot. That means for us that we have to be better prepared and plan more thoroughly. Experts say it wasn't just a clash of two armies, but also of military doctrines. Heavy technology versus mobile equipment. Along the roads in this area, it is not unusual to find whole columns of burnt-out tanks, taken out by modern Western anti-tank missiles. You just get on a pickup with the javelins and enlows and drive to the place where you expect them to come, hit them, and then you're able to leave the scene quickly. In the forest around Tetarivska, you can still see the bodies of Russian soldiers. Russian losses are believed to have been extremely high. Ukrainian soldiers describe their attacks as uncoordinated but very destructive. This school was hit by a rocket. There were tanks, there was mobile artillery, there was aviation. They sent everything they had over. And they did not care that much of this did not land on target. It was chaotic fire, shelling without any plan. Ukraine accuses Russia of systematic war crimes, shelling of civilians. They say these villages lie behind the lines and were bombed from the air. House after house destroyed, possibly to demoralize the Ukrainians. But as the next big battle begins in the east, the commander of this unit thinks that Russia's actions have made Ukrainians even more determined. We are ready, and if the West acts and quickly gives us the military aid that we need, modern military equipment and technology, then I think victory will be ours, and it might come soon already. His optimism is not shared by most experts. Most expect a long war of attrition. And for more on this, let's bring in Justin Crump. He's the CEO of the global risk analysis company Sibylline. He's also a veteran of the British Armed Forces with experience in many recent wars, and he joins us from the United Kingdom. Uh, Mr. Crump, what do you make of the comments we just heard by a Russian commander who said that full control of southern Ukraine would give Russia access to the breakaway region of Transnistria? Yeah, and this is the, the deputy commander of the um, Central Military District in a talk yesterday. So it's not come from the very top, but he's a particularly senior commander within the Russian hierarchy. So it's a comment you have to take seriously. Um, at the start of this invasion, there was a Russian battalion tactical group in Transnistria, uh, I think slated to take part in the occupation of Ukraine. Uh, and we thought that would probably move when Russian forces got close to Odessa. Um, now, that was stalled, if you remember, by... Um, the defence of Mikhailov, the city that uh, Larry Kim is the mayor of, uh, and that character defence Mikhailov a few weeks ago, and that stopped ambitions that way. But I think Russia's always led towards this plan, so it's something that's been taken seriously um, for a long time. But this is the first statement that's really pointed towards that from a senior military figure. Hence the focus right now. And just to look at the war as a whole and the constant requests from President Zelensky for weaponry. Are the Ukrainian forces getting everything they need? And, and if not, what's missing? It was interesting listening to the segment just now um, and the discussion of anti-tank missiles and rockets, which is, which is true that they're very useful indeed in slowing down the Russian armed advances. But when you really look, this has been an artillery conflict. So the the missiles were used to stop the Russian movement, um, whether by blocking the road or just the confusion caused when a vehicle explodes suddenly and, and throws everyone else into disarray. It was artillery fire landing after that that scattered Russian forces and stopped an attack that broke up the formation and, and, and did the real damage. And that's been the case throughout the war. So although it's not been as obvious or as witnessed, um, it's been artillery that's been vital to both sides. And you heard the mention of crushing Russian firepower 
um, placed down without really due regard for targeting of civilians or anything else, just laid down in an area they thought they were being attacked from. So artillery has been the key, and that's why there's been so much focus this week on providing more artillery pieces to Ukraine uh, and much more artillery ammunition to Ukraine, including NATO systems um, that have come from a number of NATO countries. Canada has been very prominent. The US has sent uh, howitzers as well. They're training Ukrainian forces in how to use those. But most importantly, the ammunition. I mean, the, the amount of ammunition that gets used in this sort of conflict is huge. And will that artillery and these new weapons coming Ukrainian way be decisive where the, the big part of the fighting is, is occurring now in, in the east? It's too early to say, and I hate that answer as an analyst, um, but it really is a very finely balanced uh, combat in the Donbass. Russia has concentrated more power there than it had at the start of the war. Conversely, Ukraine's been able to move some forces around since the Russians left the north. Um, they've particularly put forces around Kharkiv to threaten the back of the Russians if the Russians advance. Um, and they've had time to dig in positions to choose the ground they're going to defend. So um, both sides have got advantages over where they started the conflict. Both sides have got disadvantages. And the Russians still don't have an overwhelming imperial uh, superiority on the, on the battlefield. Uh, we attack at three to one. The Russians are probably at two to one at the moment, which is not a situation that's ideal. Um, they can't really generate a lot more force in the Donbass. So I think this is one of the reasons that the advance there is very slow at the moment. Um, also, the weather doesn't suit right now. And I think Russia is trying to find a way through the Ukrainian defences slowly and steadily. Um, but it remains very much in the balance, especially with these additional weapon systems coming in to support Ukraine. Uh, and hence, there's a little bit of a race against time, I think, for both sides to try and either stall the Russian offensive from the Ukrainian side um, or from the Russians just to finally overwhelm the Ukrainian forces and achieve um, something that looks like uh, at least the beginnings of a success by the 9th of May. OK, Mr. Crump, thank you for that insight. Justin Crump, a military analyst and CEO of Sibling. Here's a look now at some of the other developments in the war in Ukraine. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres is set to visit Moscow on Tuesday to meet Russian President Vladimir Putin. He'll then head to Ukraine for talks with President Volodymyr Zelensky. Guterres will discuss steps to bring about peace following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Russia has confirmed the death of one of the crew members of its flagship missile cruiser Moskva a week after it sank in the Black Sea. The Ministry of Defense said nearly 400 crew members had been evacuated. Kremlin critics suspect a much higher number of dead and missing, saying the ship's crew was about 500 strong. A court in Moscow has ordered opposition activist Vladimir Karamurza to remain in pretrial detention for allegedly spreading fake news about Russia's army. A criminal case has been opened against the activist, who was earlier arrested um, this month for avoiding police officers.